Welcome back to What's New with Mead. We're in episode 43, and I have Frank Goldbeck. I almost said Goldbreck. I don't know why I put an R in there. Frank Goldbeck here to chat about um, some big things happening in his world. And uh, Frank's got a lot of things. He's a very busy mead making guy, and so I'm excited to chat with him. So, Frank, thanks for being here. Um, I'm glad you're here. Yeah, stoked to be here with you and stoked to talk mead and honey and mead institute and all kinds of good things going on in our world so stoked yeah. to, stoked to so um i've been wanting to chat with you for a long time especially since uh we last time we talked was on our the video i put out about the mead institute and i had a great chance to sit down and, and chat with everybody involved in that and it was a lot of fun so we're kind of going to dive a little bit further into those things and then you also are a meadery owner which is a very fun thing the golden coast meadery and you have a lot of exciting things happening there. So why don't we unpack that first and then we'll start to talk about some of the Mead Institute things. Okay. Um, what's going on in Golden Coast right now? Uh, we've got a uh, kind of flagship lineup for the first time in a while with mead making professionally, getting a solid supply of honey is a challenge. And then a consistent supply of honey is a challenge because you know your product varies with your honey supply. So we've been doing this for 11 years now professionally and um, nailing that piece down has, has been a challenge. Also, as we've learned more about the ecological impact of honey and the impact we want to have in the world and the leadership we want to uh, hopefully take on in the world of alcohol, right? Alcohol is a $1.5 trillion industry globally. Oh, wow. Like it's huge. Mm -hmm. um, so the impact of that, alcohol has on the earth um, you know it's primarily uh, annual monocultures where the bees are um, a perennial polyculture right so the contrast between beer wine and spirits where you're tearing up nature to plant one crop to create a sugar that you then ferment and turn into beer or wine or spirits um, is a, is a huge negative impact on the earth from major measurements of biodiversity, soil health, water sequestration. Whereas if you look at meat, on the other hand, like you get more flowering ecosystems that support more life that then uh, sequester more carbon into the soil, which then retains more water. So you get a way healthier ecosystem and you're still generating the sugar that goes into your alcohol production. So we like to say that mead can really shift the alcohol industry and agriculture globally if it gets back to its former uh, position in the world. So I'm stoked on that impact and specifically how we've sourced uh, organic honey from Brazil that has a really great uh, ecological impact in the world. It also has a great flavor profile that allows us to make these three meads, a uh, dry mead, a sweet mead, and a sour mead, all from the same honey. So we can share this impact story and share some really great meads that hopefully meet people where they're coming from and show them that, yeah, mead can be sweet if you're into that, but mead can also be dry and floral and complex and layered with our dry mead. And then mead can be tart and rich and refreshing with our sour and from those three, they're all sourced for that regenerative organic honey, um, which still needs a certification to prove that that impact is happening. It's not just greenwashing, which we're also working on. Um, and would be stoked to share that with folks if, if people are interested in what regenerative apiculture looks like, right? Apiculture is beekeeping and regenerative apiculture is apiculture that's good for the earth. So if we get out there on uh, our, our website, www.regenerativeapiculture.org, and people put their email address and name into a little form, they'll get the PDF that's like a 30-page document on what we envision is necessary to create a regenerative apiculture standard in the world. Man. Yeah. <laughs> I, so I've, I, I find that fascinating because I've never really um, honestly dove too deep into the behind the scenes. And I think a lot of people don't because uh, some – some people don't necessarily like to know how the, the milk is made <laughs> in a lot of right, ways. Right. Exactly. They just like to enjoy the milk. And so, uh, and same thing for mead, but it is important. And I think everything you're saying right now is uh, sustaining to what we do as mead makers, but not the longevity of our earth ultimately too. So I find that fascinating. You did have one little comment about, uh, obviously you're, you're sourcing this new honey, which is uh, really fascinating. And that, that intrigues me a lot. But my question is, 
you have a, a dry traditional and a sweet, and then you're going for a sour. Are you, or I guess, how are you achieving that, the sour profile? Are you using a yeast? What's your, your goal there? Or your yeah, so that's a great story. Our, our sour is really our flagship project. Um, it is something that we make and really put a lot of energy into and, and share with the world in a way that I think is unique in the mead world. And no one else that I know of is making us sour and really calling it their core product. Um, and we also got recognized by the Honey Board as one of the top 20 um, alcohols made from honey, I think, of the last decade, uh, which was cool. And that was for our, our something, something sour, which has evolved into our wildflower sour as we shifted from a California wildflower honey to this regenerative organic Brazilian honey. So the sour culture and the process that we use was uh, the product of a lot of R and D and hard work. Um, and you know, we, <laughs> um, I'm like in this awkward position of like wanting to guard my, my little secret baby. Oh, but yeah, I, don't, like I, don't, I don't feel like, don't tell me if, if it's a secret. I'm not, you just, well, yeah, I mean, I just like you have to spoil or spread any news. I was just curious. Um, it sounds like it's coming from yeast. Well, it's a, it's a co-fermentation of uh, yeast and lactobacillus. Mm. So, so we have to manage the fermentation and uh, keep both of them happy. But when we do, we get a product that's really bright and tart and still has all these great honey and floral notes and makes for a mead that really lights people up. But it really also breaks through the um, hesitance we find in the marketplace that mead's going to be too sweet and not that complex and, and not that refreshing. Whereas yeah. the sap mead is like beautiful and all of those things. Well, and that kind of hits the balance of, of meat in general. We know we talk about the tannic value to acidity to sweetness levels, and you're kind of not necessarily going into the acidity realm, but you're, you're kind of peering into there and in that, you know, sours are, are trying to emulate those things. And um, I, I feel like sometimes people will think of a sour and they think of like, at least I do, of like a farmhouse ale sour that is just like, I mean, that, that thing is all, all bite. Um, and That's so... Fun. I would, I would love, you know, I think uh, a little plug for your website. I'm, do you guys ship mead? Yep, locally? we're a Vino shipper. So, Great. you know, the 36 states that Vino shipper can ship out to, we can ship out to. Okay. So, and I'll put that down in the description. If, you, if anyone's interested in purchasing some mead from Golden Coast Meadery, um, I, of course, I want to push people your way. And it sounds, I have not had many sour meads <laughs> i've had some unintentionally on purpose but i've had i haven't had a many intentionally sour meads um so i would love to to uh get to to try yours it sounds interesting um Thanks. and of course like i said i don't want to i'm not asking you to uh spoil your methods because of course i know that well i think that there's something really powerful there and on your platform right like there's an audience that really likes nerding out on the the deep dive and so you know, I, I think if, if people are like ready to have a conversation about regenerative mead and sour mead and, and engage it in a really thoughtful way, like we want to have that conversation with them. So I'd ask them to reach out to me, you know, Frank Fullbeck at goldencoastmead.com and like email me. And then I'm happy to talk shop with folks about like how this all came together. Because there was like over a hundred different R&D uh, experiments and then like straight up divine intervention, which is a pretty great story. Uh, we, we had a distribution contract in New York. We were selling the sour meat out there and we were selling a few other meads and we sold out of the sour. And my business partner who was running the New York distribution game was like, Frank, we need more sour. I'm like, dude, we don't know how to produce it consistently. And this was like six, six years ago, seven years ago now. And, uh, and he's like, okay, well, that's what everybody wants. So can you please figure out how to make it? I'm figure like, it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, dude, we're basically at trial number 90 here. And it's like not clear what the path is going forward. And he was like, yeah, well, I'm your sales guy. And I'm telling you, I could sell all of that if you had it. So please make it. And, um, and so like I hang up the phone with him and I'm in the driveway at home. And I just like hit my head on the steering wheel. And I look up <laughs> and I'm like, mead gods. Please make it abundantly clear how to make the sour mead. 
And um, and I just kind of drove to work. And I get to work, and no shit. Sorry, probably shouldn't use that word. You're good. You're good. No kidding. There is a PhD in yeast science on my doorstep at All work. Right. And I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> 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 and sure enough, uh, he, he and I start talking, and we get to the point where I'm like, hey, dude, I've got this issue. Sometimes our sour meat tastes like this, which is awesome and bright and tart and citrusy and honey and yes. And then sometimes they taste like this, which is funky horse blanket. Like, how do we make these consistent? And he's like, hmm, well, let me take a look at it. And sure enough, he comes back uh, like a week later, like, oh, I think I isolated the strain and uh, yeah, let's just give it a try. So yeah, man, it was crazy, man. So now oh. we use that strain all the time, and the results have been great. And man. yeah, having a house strain—that's that's pretty exciting. It'd be able, a house strain for that purpose, of course. Um, so one little question on that note, and then we'll—I we'll, know we have a, another fun topic. Um, when you do these small, you said you know ninety tests, and, and I have no doubt that that is that is true. Are you doing? Um, five gallon batches obviously you don't want to invest so much time and money into a you know a 200 gallon batch are you doing five gallons one gallons at that point for your testing? yeah you know 11 years of doing this we're still working on our r&d and piloting like we literally drove out to riverside to pick up um what we're calling our pico and micro uh scale no sorry our pico is the the small jars right where we just like get a basic idea like in a one quart jar and then now we've got a micro scale which is uh 90 liters and it's a jacketed conical tank right okay. for the first that can also maintain pressure because one of the things that we've learned is that like scaling with our method isn't linear um mm. if the equipment isn't exactly the same Right. Some, some mead makers that I talk to are like, Oh no, I do a five gallon test. And if it works in that level, I can put it in my 300 gallon or 900 gallon tanks and it's going to be fine. And I'm like, dude, seriously. And they're like, yeah, and that's how we got where we're at. And I'm like, yeah, not, not for me. Like linear scaling hasn't happened, but I think it's because mm. the equipment that we've been using hasn't had the same controllability. Mm. So we just invested in a um, 90 liter system and then, a 300 liter system and then we go up to a thousand liters and then up to four thousand liters and are you wait are you pressure fermenting you mentioned that are you pressure fermenting all of these batches now no no during primary we um are you know in an airlock but no pressure oh, okay. Uh, okay but but then there is you know still a, a good amount of dissolved co2 and then when we go to um conditioning usually there's dissolved CO2 uh, mm -hmm. in the product. Yeah. Interesting. Well, yeah. Um, you have, you have me very interested in, in these things now. And I have, I have no doubt the people listening are um, also interested. So of course I'll be putting down everything to golden coast and ways you can support. And of course you, you linked your email. And so I'll put that down there for anyone interested in the process. Obviously Frank is, yeah. um, is, is willing to share and all you got to do is ask. And so uh, feel free to reach out. And, and do that let's switch Wait. gears a little bit now you okay. have i feel like you've got you're a you're a guy that has like like multi-talented you've got this awesome metery that's just flourishing and then on the other side of your fence is this mead i don't know what the education it's mead institute without a better term um you have this uh i don't know if you call yourself what you call yourself exactly but you have this system this this growing mead I don't, I don't have the right word for this. I'm, Earlier this week, someone called me an ecosystem builder for the first time. And I was like, oh. oh, is that what I've been doing for 11 years? Because like that resonates, you know, I, cool. I, yeah. I, I don't toot my horn too much. But like, you know, when UC Davis, um, I don't know if you heard that story about how UC Davis started teaching mead courses. Mm, mm -mm. Uh, it was a funny story. So I sneak into Expo West, which is this big natural food trade show that happens in Anaheim, about an hour north of me, um, yeah. right near Disneyland. And Marla Spivak, who's this MacArthur Genius Award winning bee researcher, is going to give a talk uh, hosted by Whole Foods about what we can do for the bees when colony collapse disorder is like in full swing taking off. I'm like, oh, this is cool. I want to be there for this. 
So I literally like sneak into this trade show and then get into the small room and uh, don't even have a badge or anything. And I sit next to this nice looking middle-aged lady and I recognize her name because an ex-girlfriend of mine was dating a guy with the same name who was in the honey industry. And I was like, hey, are you Josh's mom? And I actually referred to him by his nickname that like only a few people called him. And she's like, what? How do you know my son? And how do you know his nickname Ziggy? And I'm like, ah, uh, you know, weird story. But you work at UC Davis now, right? And she's like, yeah, I'm the director of the Robert Mondavi Honey and Pollinator Center. Um, or the Honey and Pollination Center at the Robert Mondavi Institute at UC Davis. And I'm like, that's awesome. UC Davis is the premier wine science university in the world. What if they did a mead course? And mm. she was like, huh, we should do a mead course. You're right. And so I was like, that's awesome. Uh, can I help you with that? And she's like, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, sure. So I'm like, well, Mazer Cup is happening in a couple of weeks and I'm going to be there. Can I just like bring an interest list to the meeting and then like see who's interested? And sure enough, Ken Schramm and Pete Bogolich were there and I got them to sign up and then they connected with Mina. And out of that was the first UC Davis mead making course. That's well, sweet. I, yeah, that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, ecosystem builder, I can, I can see it. That is, uh, that sounds exactly like what you're doing. Thanks, man. Yeah. man, that's wild. <laughs> yeah yeah and and so meat institute kind of came out of this too and i don't know if you want to delve into that now or if you want to talk about regenerative honey or uh, because i think you know honey is produced all around the world and mead used to be consumed all around the world right like five continents other than australia and antarctica there was indigenous mead traditions on every continent mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't know about the central american tradition of balche have you heard about this mm -mm. Yeah, so the Mayan people would take the honey from the stingless melipona bee, mm -hmm. which is another social bee, but it doesn't have a stinger. And they would, and like the honey, and getting the honey is really difficult because the bees actually build these little pots of wax and fill them, and they're all like, like networked together in a really weird way. So it's a lot of work to harvest this honey, but when they would, uh, they would get it, and then they'd ferment it in the trunk of the balche tree and it would be included in ceremonies and like the gods would come down to the party with the people. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. That's awesome. So it's an argument that like there is indigenous made in North and South America. If you count the Mayan empire as kind of spanning both. Yeah. Dude. Uh, wow. I, I didn't never heard of that. I, I feel, um, I feel almost wrong for not having <laughs> heard about that. Cause that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, B-A-L-C-H-E is how you spell it. So you can okay. check it out. Um, but you know that there is a mead tradition on every continent that is going back to like time immemorial, um, you know, 7,000 BC, 9,000 9, years ago in China. And then in Ethiopia, like mead goes back beyond history, right? To probably mm -hmm. our hunter-gatherer ancestors. And then in Europe, you know, pl plenty of record about the mead tradition there. In India, they were drinking mead and like the word madu. Do you know this story about the word mm -hmm. madu? So it's a really cool story. Uh, split, right? They're all kind of cousin languages derived mm -hmm. from the same Proto-Indo-European root language that comes out of like Trans-Oxiana, like the Caucasus mountain mm -hmm. region. And so those people had this diaspora that goes all the way up to Scandinavia and all the way down to India. Um, and they had this word for this drink made from honey called mm -hmm. madu. And it then cognates into met in Greek and medu in Eastern European Slavic mm -hmm. languages. And then down in India, it's still madu. Mm -hmm. But they don't really drink much alcohol made from honey other than the few meters that are getting going down there. But it has this connotation of like wisdom and sweetness and the goodness of life. And so, like, there are stories in the Rig Veda, which is, like, this ancient Hindu scripture about Vishnu walking across the universe, and his footsteps are filled with a spring of madu. Oh, interesting. Isn't that cool? Hmm. So there's, there's, like, all these epic stories that span the globe, and people can grow honey basically anywhere, but the tradition and technique of fermenting meat has been forgotten. Mm -hmm. Right. But with modern science, like, and nutrient additions, thank goodness, 
we can like <laughs> figure out how to make good meat yeah. all around the world and hopefully create a ton of value where the honey is produced rather than exporting that honey, producing the alcohol there and then importing the alcohol mm-hmm. that the sugar can be produced in one place in a regenerative way. And then the alcohol can be produced there and consumed there. And those dollars can stay local. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I love that, man. Th- your mission statement. I mean, everything that about you is, is so, um, I mean, it's community driven and obviously community is, is a word that we use for s- such a little local sphere. But uh, I think I, I love that your, your idea of community is like also taking yourself and putting it yourself in, you know, smaller areas of the world and saying like, let's make this community better too. And I think I, I love that. That's fascinating. And I think that uh, you're totally right. Everybody who is, um, able to purchase local honey, even if you're someone like me in, you know, Oklahoma city, Oklahoma, go and and help your beekeepers because obviously keeping those, those dollars moving in the same area is, uh, is helpful for the world and for that population. So. And one of, one of the coolest things about the end product, right? The bees in order to make a pound of honey have to visit 2 million flowers, right? Which is insane. So if you're making a 12% ABV meat, that's like a half a pound of honey per bottle per 750. Right. So that's like a million flower visits yeah. behind every bottle. Right. So when you're drinking that meat and if it tastes good, you're drinking a million flower visits from that place that that honey came from. If that honey came from your town or your area of the earth, and you like that meat. It's like, I like this place where this honey came from. And now it's a part of me. Like literally I am metabolizing it and it is becoming a part of my body. And so yeah. Yeah, it's super. That's cool. dude. That's I love that. Okay. So I know, I know we don't have a lot of time and I want to honor your time. Well, <laughs> so there's, there's, uh, I, I feel like um, I could go down the rabbit hole and it, this, this might mean that we got to get back on another time and have a part two, because there's, I feel like we're just, we're just scratching the surface, but yeah. there's this other thing in your world called the meat institute now can yeah. you uh give us uh tell us about the meat institute what is it yeah um it is a desire to have a professional conversation about what quality is in meat right and quality is this like epic term it's this idea that something is good and good is this very deep thing right like we have a resonance about what is good in our own sense but what is it to you and how can we identify what those characteristics are and do it in a way that's professional and transparent and empowering, right? Mm-hmm. So that's what Meat Institute wants to do is uh, define these things in a professional, transparent way, and then empower people in the mead industry and in the mead community to identify what quality is to them and to all of us and how we identify it and how we create it and how we share it. And like, we don't at all want to crush creativity. Um, that was one of the things that Billy Belts at Lost Cause like jumped on board with us first about was like, hey, quality is cool, but who's to say what good quality is and what creativity is, you know, and where's the edge between that? So we've come up with this working definition of quality mead being uh, made with intentions from the best ingredients for the style of mead that you set out to create. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then then the technical side of that is free of technical flaws, mm-hmm. right? Which we're still working. So one of the most exciting prog- programs that we're working on at Meat Institute, and Ken Tram's been leading this one, is uh, working with one of the leading uh, wine testing labs to create a battery of tests. So for one fee, a professional meter, you can send off uh, the right amount of samples to this lab and get objective measurements of these certain compounds that we've all identified, you know, and that the, the, you know, Ken Tram and Pete Bocklich who are on the board at Mazer Cup and then Carvin Wilson, who now is the chief administrator of Mazer Cup. Um, right. They, yeah. they have identified what a lot of these flaws are for the community. And now we're trying to figure out what the thresholds are that people can perceive them at so that a meter, can send off a sample get it back and know that their mead was under those thresholds and therefore they can like put this stamp on it and it says the quality is high because these technical achievements have been achieved. 
what are some of those um, thresholds you're, you're talking about? Like, yeah, what? like Merc Captains. Do you know Merc Captains? Mm -mm. So Merc Captains is something that sulfur can turn into, mm. and it has like a burnt tire character. Okay. Yeah, um, diacetyl, right? Mm -hmm. If yes. used to stress, uh, you get that band aid and vinyl oh. flavor profile. Um, what other things are we looking at? Like literally, there are, I think fourteen items. Is is a uh, uh, um, acetone on that list? That uh, the um, uh, uh, nail polish remover ish idea is that what I think that's what that's called. But there's a proper technical term for it that I always blank on. Uh, ethyl acetate. Yeah, there. that sounds right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, so higher order alcohols are some of them. Um, esters that are just not welcome are some of them and mm -hmm. then um sulfurs and other uh you know stress yeast compounds we're also looking at hydroxymethyl furfural uh are you familiar with that one it, it sounds familiar but i it is i'm not sure exactly hmf is. hmf is the the shortcut name for it and uh -huh. you know sometimes it can be pleasant like give a toasty caramely um somewhere in that range and mm -hmm. then sometimes it can be like burnt astringent bitter mm. uh you know so we we want to really empower the mead community to be able to go out into the wine world and the spirits world and the beer world and say like our stuff's really great and we yeah. it's not just us that believes this there are numbers to back this up and we're really confident that when you try it you're gonna like it. yeah well, I, I, one thing, and I, and I said this when we did the original video was I, I like that you guys are, um, strategically running forward to make this a better community. And, and I, I do also love that you mentioned, and I, I forget his name already. It's terrible, but lost cause owner, uh, Billy, Billy, Billy who, yeah. who, um, really harped on creative creativity in general, because I, obviously, um, sometimes when you put, put your thumb down on, on something people go, well, now I can't do anything. You know, I can only live in this box. And as somebody who uh, frankly creates a lot of outrageous meads and, you know, does it not only just for YouTube, but just for fun, you know, what, what kind of crazy combinations can I make? Um, I, I want this hobby to be limitless, but also be uh, able to go somewhere. Sometimes when you take away all the limits, something goes, whatever that is, can go nowhere because then you have 10,000 iterations of the same idea. And the, that one idea never really permeates to go far enough. And so I think having the standards and having the, the uh, I mean, I don't want to say truths, but protocol that these are the things we're looking for in a, a proper mead um, is important for us. And or these are the things we want to make sure are not there. And yeah, yeah. Well, right? Yeah. And no, you're just talking about, you're mentioning all of those uh, um, fusels, basically. Really, I, I always refer back to, I'm like, I know this could be a fusel. I need to find, and I don't know if it's out there, it could be just a great chart of all of the 14 fusels. You know what I mean? And just like hang it up on my wall. So when I'm tasting stuff, I'm going, am I tasting this? Because they're apparent. And the fact that we have a whole community that is um, built upon identifying and uh, creating, I guess, tiers of, um, I guess, ability to taste those things is, is, important and us as home brewers are just uh struggling to always taste those things my friend tony always talks about seller tongue i don't know if it, he's like a sommelier like you know thing and i feel like a lot of mean makers get get seller tongue meaning that they they only taste their own stuff and then they have no concept of what the rest of the world is and so obviously there's a lot more to unpack there but tasting other meads can uh, help your palate and help you identify good and bad. Exactly. Um, cellar tongue is the thing that holds us back in a lot of ways, right? When you don't notice a flaw that's technically there and mm -hmm. people want to be encouraging to an entrepreneur and then they like try something and they go, Ooh, that's nice. <laughs> but like, you know, if, if yeah. it's not really clean and bright and beautiful, it's 
not going to get a second sale, you know? Yeah. So for people and, and I think also it will unlock creativity, right? Cause if you know that you're creating something that's never been created before and it's clean and you're really stoked on it, then when you're shouting from the rooftops and people like the skeptics show up, and they're yeah. like, oh, I don't know about this. And you're like, yo, I've got the numbers. This is clean. Mm -hmm. Like, if it's not your cup of tea, go find another cup of tea. But like, this is a beautiful thing that we're stoked on and we're confident it's clean and quality. Yeah. You know? I was talking to, I had an opportunity to chat with um, the uh, a a MMA Mead Maker of the Year from last year, Alan Martin, who he's, you know, the, the, the Mead Maker of the Year. And um, he was talking about, one of the brews he'd sent out, it was like a fireweed traditional and he'd sent it to like seven or eight competitions and seven of the competitions gave it forties plus. And then one competition gave it like a 20 or something. And he was like, what's going on with that? And I think that is, that, that is exactly what you're talking about. Obviously uh, we are palate driven people. And especially when we enter the competition sphere, we are hopeful that whoever's tasting our meat is a, uh, for lack of a better term, competent mead judge, yeah. but sometimes palates don't like things as well. And so um, giving your stuff to multiple people and getting opinions is the only way to get real feedback, I would say. And I don't know if you're familiar with that Chico state analysis of the mm -hmm. California state wine competition and mm -hmm. the, the results there, right? Like, yeah. If, <laughs> so we're biased and after a yeah. few drinks, Right. If you're not spitting, and even if you are spitting, your ability to taste will degrade. Right. Mm -hmm. So Susan Rude at um, Prairie Rose Meadery had a great piece of guidance for me when I was younger, uh, which was like, there's means that you like, there's means that your customers like, and there's means that win awards. And trying to find the place where all three of those circles overlap is very difficult. But yes. if you like keep it in those first two of means you like and means that your customers like, like you'll be able to make a living if you keep doing that and then if you go after the awards too like all the better go yeah. for it but yeah you know. i think you can take that to a micro sphere too obviously as someone who owns a meadery you are you're seeking all three in in a lot of ways and um even someone like myself who i don't have a meadery necessarily but i do have a um a customer base being friends and family and stuff and my goal, and I think a lot of people's goal is to make mead for ourselves. I think that should be your primary goal is like make stuff you want to drink. Cause I think the moment you stop appreciating what you drink is the moment you lose the joy of mead making. But then, um, you know, primary you, then your friends, family, those people. And then if you are really just wanting to pursue it, kind of going to that upper echelon of, you know, I want to, I want to win a Mazer cup or I want to win a, a Dormos cup or whatever competition you're entering. Um, so yeah, that's important that it is hard to hit all three sometimes because there is a difference. And I hate that there's a difference between an award winning mead and a, a friendly mead, but I think it's true. It's a little bit unfortunate. You, true. Have you ever judged a mead competition? Yeah, we actually, so my, my friend doing the most tonight, we have one called Mead Stampede that we've done. We did oh, last yeah. year and we, okay. um, we have one we're doing again this year. So I spent some time um, last year judging and uh, it's a lot of fun. It is, it is hard though. Like you said, once you get a few drinks in you, you're like, okay, well, let's get, <laughs> keep, and keep going. And fun a thing, you know, and the, the means that are the most intense and the most like out there grab you by the nose and the tongue and pull you into the glass like those are going to stand out in that context mm -hmm. so i think it's just something that we all kind of recognize now and and know that if you can get all three you're doing a lot of work and making it happen yeah, yeah. and and all yeah. of that goes back to kind of what you hearkened to in the beginning is um proper mead management and that goes back to of course you know we talk about sanitizing and we talk about that stuff but more importantly modern mead practices of taking care of your yeast and i think methodically actually thinking out your meads and, and you that's what you started with you said hey make sure you you have an idea of what your mead is going to be before you start think about what you want to do with this because if you don't it you can kind of fly by the seat of your pants for only so far. And then you kind of run into some walls and go, wait, I wasn't expecting this. So mm -hmm. you're never going to get out of the, the um, danger zone of uh, fermentation and the, the 
struggles that come there. But you can always plan and say like, I want this ABV and I'd love to try and get these flavors. How can I achieve it? These choices are going to get me there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. So, yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm, like I said, I know you got, you have limited time. I want to know how can we, um, how can people connect with the Mead Institute and be involved with that? Yeah. So Mead Institute, we, we're on our third web designer now. Uh, we were supposed to have a website up earlier, but, um, you know, COVID has made for some interesting times and, we're now on web designer number three. And the goal is to have the website up by the end of um, March at the latest, but we're shooting for earlier than that. And when it's up, people are going to be able to join the Meat Institute at various levels, whether they're, um, you know, huge grocery chains that want a, a professional membership or they're amateur mead makers or just mead enthusiasts, uh, whether they're mead servers whatever, they're going to be able to get access to the tasting grid, which is this tool that uh, Ken Tram and Allison Tram. And I mean, we had some legends like Randy Mosher and Ray Daniels and three master sommeliers uh, help us develop this tool to navigate the world of mead and to hopefully hone, you know, your number one tool in appreciating and understanding the means that you're making, which is your own organoleptic capacity. Right. Mm -hmm. So this uh, tasting grid walks you through how to taste and engage your meads and other meads with a really robust language chart and then even a glossary. So this tool, we think, is the only off the shelf option for folks to get the intro to mead um, education that we want to see in the world um, beyond just making it or going through the forums and spending a ton of time learning that way. So members will be able to get that. Um, they'll also get access to this QA, QC testing uh, battery at the discounted price that we're negotiating with this wine testing lab. And then access to UC Davis quality assurance, quality control course that we're working on them with. Um, and we're looking at October of next year for, for that course. And by next year, I mean next school year. 2022 is upon us. Uh -huh. um, so people can go to meetinstitute.com right now and just enter their email address to get on our email list so that they're notified. We're also on Instagram, uh, though our social media presence has kind of taken a backseat to just getting the website up um, and then doing this work with these really exciting programs. Oh, one other thing that I wanted to just plug is we're working on honey fingerprinting with uh, Dr. Corey Amal at Eastern Michigan uh, University, which is like this effort to do a bunch of nuclear magnetic resonance testing on honey mm -hmm. to identify what pure examples of varietal honeys are so that we can determine what adulterated examples are because ah. honey adulteration is a huge issue right yeah um and and hopefully democratize that like right now there are chemical uh testing companies that will charge a significant amount uh to determine whether honey is legit or not but mm -hmm. we're thinking that we might be able to get that price down significantly at the end of this program so that people can confidently buy honey and use it for mead making and know that it's legit honey uh, we're also, <laughs> this is like a few years down the road, uh, hoping to put together that matrix of this kind of honey with this kind of yeast equals this kind of mead, right? Uh, yeah. Because uh -huh. every honey is like a different precursor right. for this black box of yeast genetics and what flavors come out. Mm -hmm. We think that there are probably some honeys and some yeast that are just incompatible and are going to produce off flavors uh, from yeah. that dynamic. But that's a lot of research and we're hopefully getting it started with this partnership with Corey Amal at Eastern Michigan. Well, that's like, um, you know, there's the Lalamond, there's a yeast chart that has, that goes through every single, you know, this yeast is great for white wines and this one's great for red and this one's great for blah, blah, blah. And it goes through every single one. I mean, you're, you're talking about the same thing for mead. And I think that is, uh, that's what with people honey. want. Yeah. With honeys. Right. And so, I think that's what people have been like searching for. And I, and I see that in my comments all the time, you know, people ask me what's the best yeast for whatever this, this combination. And at this point I can only give speculation and personal experience. And obviously I have limited personal experience in that regard. So that that's, I am excited for that. <laughs> that sounds like a very um, eye-opening thing for 
everyone who makes mead, whether you are new or old, to uh, to look at that chart and be able to say, oh, yeah, I've done that. Or, oh, I need to try that. So Yeah, and Carvin Wilson, uh, uh, you know, um, he's a software nerd, and he's like, we could make a mead craft recipe wizard. You know, what kind of honey are you starting with? Then input that into the program, and then it'll spit out, you know, what kind of styles are you trying to create? And it'll uh-huh. spit out recommendations. And at this point, it would be based off of the, like, accumulated knowledge and experience of Carvin and Pete and Ken, and mm-hmm. maybe me. But compared to those guys, man, my knowledge <laughs> on that stuff is much smaller. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Man. So, okay. So, that's, that's everything happening with the Mead Institute. Is there anything else you would like to plug as far as your meadery is concerned? Or how can yeah, we support Golden you Coast. there? Thanks. So Golden Coast Mead, um, we didn't talk about the canned meads and we're going to be rolling those back out. Um, they're 5%. They're just honey water fermentation, no sulfites, um, sour, sweet, and dry. And we can ship those in California when they're back online. So people mm-hmm. that live in California can get those. <clears throat> um, and then we do have a couple special batches that we're pretty excited about on um, Vino Shipper, which include one called Numa or Chalatanango Sour. And that's made with a honey from El Salvador that was grown mm-hmm. by these beekeepers who are super aligned philosophically on regenerative beekeeping. And the honey is a rich, multi um flavor profile. And when we put it through our sour yeast or sour fermentation process, it came out with this really rich apple note. And But it's not that uh, hot... Uh, you know, um, Jolly Rancher apple. It's going to be like, <laughs> yeah, 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 rich, caramely, uh, brown sugar apple with a tart back end. Yeah. So we're super excited about that. I mean, get some water. Oh, you're good. You're good. I totally understand. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So, uh, Chalatanango sour online. And then we have, um, or desert blossom honey, which is honey from the Sonoran Desert. So a lot of mesquite, but then, and that mead is this just beautiful expression of the desert. And it's like smoky, but floral and really long in the finish and really like elegant. Um, Ken Tran was like, you know, Frank, this is like, I mean, the pieces that balance this mead are like feathers and and I was like and stardust and he's like yeah I mean you are, you are just dealing with the lightest components of the mead stool in terms of acidity and sweetness and florality and alcohol mm-hmm. and um, if people are into that you know just a, a pure traditional that's that's really uh, delicate uh, we're excited about that one too yeah well so Frank I am I'm going to be making sure that everything everything that is meat institute related and golden coast is down in the description so everybody listening or watching can can go and support you and and i think that um on both endeavors you are you know it's kind of fun because on one end you're you're creating all of these awesome recipes and things and you're getting to commercialize and and share these great meads and then on the flip side you are um tackling I'll say great mead issues found in our world and kind of in, in some ways um, commercializing and making our world, uh, our mead world, a, a better and easier place to be a part of. And so I find that super fascinating and I hope that everybody listening is um, in support of that. I, I, it feels weird to say because everybody listening who cares about mead should be in support of mead growth. And, and I think you guys are, are seeking to grow our meat community in a greater way. So I appreciate that. Yeah, we, we like to say, you know, more meat equals more bees equals more life. But ultimately, it's the meat drinkers and the people that make the meat and share the meat, right? Mm-hmm. It's all of us working together to make that happen, uh, that it's going to make a meaningful change. And, and it's going to make our lives a lot of fun while we do it, right? We can like yeah. sit there and kind of like worry, or we can like put our lever into the machine and like start to move it in that direction by making meat and sharing it with people so yeah if people want to jump onto our our little regenerative mead parade and help it grow we would love to have them and to have you sharing the story we are grateful 
for this opportunity. Hey, well, I thank you for your time. I know that you're a busy guy and uh, I, I'm just glad we got to sit down this evening and chat. And of course, like I said, everything, it will be down in the description of this and the podcast player if you're listening on that. But go support Frank in all of his endeavors and the Meat Institute and Golden Coast. Um, the, we are responsible, everybody listening, for making the mead community better. And it's as simple as just sometimes clicking on a website. You never know what you'll find on that website that makes you interested. Um, so click on it and just kind of peruse it around. It takes 15 seconds. You'll never know what you will um, find out of that. So Frank, thank you for your time. This has been a lot of fun. And um, I, I mentioned it earlier, and I really mean it. You are such a wealth of knowledge on, especially everything beekeeping and honey, uh, pollination like i would love to have you back on to talk more about this because the people who are listening need to understand and, and kind of hear more about the back end process process how is the milk made you know we got to learn that because we'll appreciate me even more when we understand what goes into it so i i thank you for your knowledge on that and uh, i'm hopeful to get you back on yeah i'd love to be back thanks for having fun. me yeah, yeah cheers to everybody out there Absolutely. All right, Frank, we'll chat with you again soon. Thanks again. You bet. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.